we have as an industry by and large treated performance as, and accessibility as something that's separate from web design. It's not part of the craft, right? It's something extra. You know, even the chatbot example you mentioned before, the or I can envision a situation in which a product manager is maybe like, okay, well, accessibility is not part of the MVP, right? We need to get this out the door. We need to get this in front of our users, in front of investors, right? And we'll think about the accessibility needs in a later milestone. I think that's a very common approach, but you know, the actual like interaction model of a chatbot, you know, there's nothing to say that all has to happen on a client, right? That by default, it could just be a form that's posting somewhere and getting a response back. Like that's a very simple interaction model. But um, I think we tend to index on the very sort of like flashy UI model without thinking about like, is this well built? Is this resilient? Is it fast? Is it going to be accessible to somebody who doesn't have a device like mine? And I think that historically, and this is just my opinion here, but I think a lot of the advocacy work around performance, and around accessibility has been targeted at individual designers, which I think it should be. I mean, because there's a lot of education that needs to happen. I mean, I'm still learning about performance and accessibility, and I've been in the industry for entirely too long. I think my opinion is that unfortunately, without that sort of like organizational reckoning, without leadership of an organization actually saying that this is a priority for us as a product organization, individual designers and engineers caring doesn't scale, right? That this is something that needs to be budgeted for, it needs to be resourced appropriately, needs to be treated as part of the core offering that these companies are bringing to the market. And until that happens, I don't know how we have a conversation as an industry, how we actually address that as a, as a problem, but it needs to be addressed because there's a lot of work to do. I see those web aim, um, million homepages reports every year, and uh, there's just so much work to do. My name is Scott Mietling, and this is the Mechanical Inc. Podcast, a podcast about open source, the open web, sustainability, and those who want to make the web and the world a better place. Hey, Ethan, and welcome to the Mechanical Inc. Podcast. Hey, thanks, Skulk. It's really good to be here. It's a huge pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to, to have a conversation with me and share all the amazing things we are bound to talk about here today. And as, a, as an introduction to all of that, I would love for you to give us all of us an uh, introduction of who you are and what it is you do. And I like to always say, what gets you out of the bed in the morning? Man, that's, that's, a, that's a great lead in. Um, the thing that probably gets me out of the bed most is... Uh, coffee and my two kittens um but uh but there's a lot there's a lot of good stuff going on right now uh, so my name is ethan marcott i'm a designer based in boston massachusetts here in the united states and man um I, some of your listeners might know me from uh as the person who coined the term responsive web design um i've been a working web designer for 20 years or so and I've always always been really excited about this idea of like the web as a medium that can exist anywhere on any kind of screen, on any kind of device. And responsive web design sort of came out of that thinking. And um, so that that was about, well, 14 years ago now. That's that's kind of weird to say out loud. But um, uh, that that pretty dramatically overtook my design practice after that point. So, uh, you know, I've worked with redesigns of all sorts of scales and sizes. I worked on the Boston Globe responsive redesign. I've worked for other publications uh, like New York Magazine, um, done some consulting for ProPublica, um, for the Sundance Film Festival. But in more recent years, a lot of my practice has been sort of focused on design systems, um, helping organizations think about um, how they talk about and ship design at a scale that's useful to them. Um, so working with their teams internally and helping them think about their processes and workflows around design and how they actually communicate and work together. Um, but, uh, 
what I've done most recently is not really directly related to any of that, which is I just came out with a book called You Deserve a Tech Union, um, looking at worker power and the need for unions in the tech industry. Um, so that's uh, there's probably a lot of stuff we can dig into there, but that's uh, that's 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 a lot of that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, I guess. Yeah, that's that's an exciting 14 years um, and a varied 14 <laughs> <That's> years. <true. laughs> um, that's very true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's two things there, but I think I want to I, I want to like kind of like step way back and say for those who don't know. Um, and I mean, I, I'm guessing I'm asking this kind of for myself because my interpretation of a union is probably going to be different from yours and somebody else's. Um, for me in South Africa, um, historically, unions have not been the greatest thing on earth. Um, they've been behind a lot of strikes and strikes that has disrupted people's lives, uh, you know, and, and the strikes have, have often not been peaceful strikes, let's put it that way. So, you know, when I when I often hear about people talking about unions and the lack of unionization in, in tech and especially in the US and that kind of thing, I'm like, why well, is that a bad thing? But then, <laughs> because, you know, my, my experience from unions is that it's not necessarily a positive thing for society and for the people involved and that kind of thing. But, Having worked at Mozilla for almost 12 years, um, I, I saw the other side and I worked with a lot of people in the US and I got a different understanding of what, what a union is. So I think before we dig into why you say that we all deserve a tech union, which I agree with, by the way, um, maybe let's talk about the broader thing, like what is a union in general and maybe specifically for you? Yeah, that's that's such a great question. Um, and I think there's so much there to talk about because because I, I think you're right. I think um, every country has its own labor history and its own relationship with organized labor. And so, like you said, uh, your your experience with what a, what a union means in South Africa is very different than what I might be when I talk about unions. Um, Part of that is because a union exists in a legal context, right? That there are there are laws that govern how it behaves, how it can operate, the protections that it offers to its members, the power that it has in a country. And at least from where I'm writing and living in the United States, um, those legal protections tend to be very curtailed. Um, that by and large, labor law in the United States is very pro-business very pro-employer um, but with that said I mean there's there's some real benefits to joining a union and I think there's a broader truth there though which is that a union in any country broadly speaking means a group of workers people who work at a co company or in an industry who are organizing together to achieve something to to you know win some improvements in the workplace to gain some protections to instrument some sort of political change. Um, so that's that's the sort of like really broad sort of like cross-cultural working definition I use in the book. Um, but the other thing that I think you're alluding to is that, and this is something I, I try to communicate a lot in my writing, is that unions are made up of people. And as such, um, unions aren't inherently good or evil, or progressive, or conservative, that they reflect the, the, the beliefs and the values of the people who make up that union. Um, you know, I, uh, I wrote about this recently in an op-ed, but um, here in the United States, the company OpenAI that makes ChatGPT and a bunch of other sort of like, quote-unquote, artificial intelligence platforms, recently had one of its most, one of the most successful examples of worker power in tech, where they basically, uh, their CEO was ousted. And then an overwhelming majority of workers at the company basically signed a letter saying that you have to bring the CEO back or we're going to resign en masse. And that is a tremendous example of what happens when workers organize together and move in a direction to achieve something that they want. 
at the same time, and I wrote about this in the op-ed, like, um, this is a company whose products are quite literally trying to automate away the value of human work. So it's like, <laughs> it's, it's really hard to see that as a, as a winning example of worker power. But I do think it's a good example of saying, like, um, organization of workers is something that reflects something that those workers want. Um, and that could be used for good, that could be used for ill, but ultimately it's about workers banding together, identifying something they want to see happen, and moving to, to uh, instrument that. Um, the last thing I'll say is like the, the main reason that I wrote about unions and the need for unions is here in the United States, um, forming a union with your coworkers is a path to getting a contract, literally setting down in plain terms in a document, um, the, uh, the terms that govern your relationship with your employer. Um, and in that contract, you can bargain collectively for improvements to salary, to working conditions, to your benefits. And that's something that we don't really have as workers here in the United States, that it's a profoundly, well, undemocratic relationship with your employer, that they set down the terms of how you work with them. And a union is quite literally a way of changing that relationship and uh, as a group of workers fighting for improvements in, in your workplace and in your relationship to tech work. Yeah, I mean, from that perspective, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, I wonder if perhaps if there were more unions, if these incredible layoffs would have been, there been less of it because these people would have been more protected from it. Um, I mean, I was impacted by it, but it, it's it's in a very, very different setup and from a different perspective than what I've seen at like, you know, Google and that where literally hundreds or even thousands of people are just like, sorry, but your role no longer exists. And um, goodbye and good luck. Uh, and for some people, um, it sucks from a kind of like personal perspective, like, oh, man, I loved working with these people and now I have to go find a different role. But financially, they're OK, right? They they can like go for three months and not, not be too concerned about money or anything like that. For other people that I've seen personally, it's literally like I'm in dire straits from day one because end of the month, I'm going to need to pay for Medicaid out of my own pocket and I don't have it. But... I have this, that, and the other disease that needs chronic medication, and I cannot just stop it. Like, I could literally end up in the hospital if I try and do that. So it, it's it's a real and present danger, you know, that can happen to people. Absolutely. Absolutely, Skalka. That's, a, that's, a, that's an incredibly well-phrased way of putting it. Um, I think what the last year and a half of layoffs have shown us is that there's a tremendous amount of precarity involved in tech work, that we don't have a lot of guarantees around the state of our employment, how long we'll be employed there, how we'll be treated when we're laid off. Um, you know, there's 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 two examples that I, I used early on in the book. One example is taken from Twitter at the end of 2022 when it was purchased by Elon Musk, and he proceeded to decimate the workforce and lay off half of the employees and treat the remainder incredibly poorly. And that's the one example, and then I contrast that with layoffs that happened around the same time at Stripe, where workers were given incredibly generous uh, layoff benefits. Um, they were treated very well. Um, they were treated humanely. But the, the parallel between those two examples is that the people at the head of both companies basically get to set the terms of how the workers are treated when they're asked to leave the company. And a union contract can't necessarily prevent a layoff, but it can dictate how you're treated if you do happen to lose your job. The number of months of severance you might get, the amount of notice that you get in advance of the layoff, um, whether more senior members are impacted less readily than more junior members. I mean, these are things that, again, as a union, you can bargain for collectively to basically explore that question of like, okay, well, if I do lose my job, how do I want to be treated as a human being? And I think that you know, that, that applies to so many other aspects of our work, not just layoffs. Like, what kind of health insurance would I like? Um, do I want to be treated as an at-will employee? Like, a, a union contract allows you to sort of open yourself up to those possibilities of something better and uh, actually getting guarantees around them. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very few guarantees in life. So, you know, if we can 
if we can facilitate some additional ones for ourselves, then I think we should totally do that. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder, like, I mean, it, it, it feels kind of obvious <laughs> listening to you talk about all these things and, you know, realizing the importance of this, um, why you would have written the book, but maybe if you wanted to just talk about from your perspective, like, why did you one day sit around and say, you know what, I should write a book and I should call it, you deserve a tech union. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it was a, I mean, it kind of like responsive web design, it was a long, slow build up. It wasn't, uh, I, I wish it was an overnight conversion. But um, I, I talk about this a little bit in the book, but like, I've always cared kind of abstractly about unions, like I sort of knew that they were an important thing, but I didn't grow up in a union family. Um, so um, when I first joined the tech industry, I had this impression that like, unions didn't directly apply to my job that they were you know something that was an artifact of the 20th century that because i worked inside i wasn't really working with my hands i wasn't a manual laborer i didn't really need protections of you know that a union could provide um and it's interesting because when i started interviewing people for the book that was something that i heard from a number of people that you know again kind of similar refrains that like unions didn't really apply to the 21st century or didn't apply to the tech industry. Um, but one of the things that happened after the 2016 election here in the United States was I started reading a lot more about labor histories in the United States and the relationship between governments and organized workers and started to understand a little bit more about how unions function and then started to look at a lot of the activism that was happening in tech around that time that workers were actually starting to ask questions about how do we want our labor to be used? You know, there was a lot of people being aware of like the potential for building a database of people in the United States who might ascribe to a certain religion or for using some of the technology to build a virtual border wall you know, for, for literal cruelties against marginalized populations. And so there was this sort of like reckoning point in the industry, I think, about like um, seeing our industry as something that was like different and better than everything that had come before it, but also seeing it as a real vehicle for potential harm. And so I was kind of on, I was very much on the sidelines of this, but there were a lot of collective actions that were happening around this time where workers were signing open letters and presenting them to their employers saying that we don't want our labor used for some of these things. Um, and that kind of crystallized for me in 2018 when Google was protesting over the course of about a year and a half, a lot of defense contracts that were becoming um, public in the company or for producing a uh, a version of Google search engine for deployment in mainland China. So there's a real potential for human rights abuses there. Um, and then ultimately that sort of crystallized in 2018 with the Google walkouts where 20,000 workers at Google, both full-time employees and contractors sort of pushed away from their desks and um, walked out of the company uh, to protest um, well, basically like sexual abuse allegations that were being levied against some former executives. And they're, they're literally asking for safety protections at work, you know, that trying to improve their workplace together. So that, that, that for me was just like a gradual wave of things changing in the industry, being led by people who are directly impacted by some of the worst things that the tech industry has done. And um, that organizing and that activism made me realize that unions do have a place here, that we can fight for those protections at the bargaining table, not just, not just in protests and not just in open letters, although we can and should do that, um, that, uh, that unions can also play a role here as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, some companies took that step without me having to say anything. I mean, Kickstarter, Glitch, you know, people were literally forming unions because they had those results. Uh, those realizations themselves so yeah yeah so so the book was also i guess a kind of like for people like me for example as as a teaching vehicle right to explain 
how you see it and what what the benefits of a union can be when it's used in a in in the right way let's let's say that i ho- i hope so i mean the the book is not my story it's the story of the dozens and dozens of people that i interviewed from across the tech industry's labor movement and that's activists that's scholars that's researchers that's um full-time union organizers even a couple economists and and of course you know many many workers who were in the process of setting up their first union um i really hope that if the book does one thing right it's it's that it makes those stories more accessible to more people because this this idea of like unions in tech isn't like it's not my sort of like nice idea it's um it's something that's happening now you know that these there are unions in tech and i want to make them more accessible to more people and um i hope the reader understands that they're they're very capable of doing just that yeah yeah that's great and i wonder um starting a union like having that in place from day one, I'm going to try and make a parallel here to to something else. Um, it's almost like starting with an accessible website instead of trying to bolt it on afterwards, right? So right. you work at a company, right. you you realize that um, you feel very unsafe, um, both like maybe like some of the stuff that you've mentioned now about the abuses and things like that, but then also just from a perspective of I can be let go at any point and I have really no control over that. I have no control over what happens to me post layoff, all these kinds of things. We should probably think about starting a union and so that we can get some protections for us and and my fellow colleagues. So you know, same thing as with accessibility, where you you build a site and then like people start telling you like I, I would love to use your product, but I I cannot because I can't use a mouse or I can't see you or whatever the case may be. Um, so I wonder, is there an is there a need or a, is there a way that we can kind of do this right from the get go? Like I'm I'm referring you to some some things that you've mentioned, and I, I think for me an example of that is Egalia. Um, so it's one of the the companies that works on a lot of like I'm sure you know them very well. But for the people who don't, like they do a lot of work on browsers. Like a lot of features that's implemented in, in browsers is actually done by Egalia, and you know not by the the engineers at the companies. Um, but they have this interesting setup where there's no ceo there's no c level at all each employee that joins the company is a they have a vested interest in the success of the company because they are part owner in quotes if you want to say it like that so and i think you you mentioned stuff about this idea of worker led organizations and the need for collectives um do you want to dig into that a little bit more and maybe expand on on what exactly that means yeah, absolutely. Um, so just because I wrote a whole book on unions doesn't mean that I think that that's the only way to improve our relationship to tech work. Um, I do think that worker light organizations, uh, cooperatives like Egalia, I do think that there are real needs for um, a variety of solutions to be applied to the variety of problems we have in the tech industry. I think that the reason that I wanted to write about unions specifically is because that's where I saw the the bulk of the activity happening in tech, where people are trying to effectively um, install like a little engine for democracy in ex- in an existing workplace. Um, but there are absolutely examples of um, alternative power structures. Uh, cooperatives are a great example. Egalia is a good one. Um, there's another agency called Boku. Um, here, based here in Boston, I believe. And they actually recently converted from a more traditional um, agency to a, co- a cooperative worker-led one. Um, and they also wrote about the experience, I think, a fair bit on their blog. So that might be of interest to some folks who are curious about sort of converting an existing organization. But um, yeah, it just wasn't a real big focus for me because, um, again, like the, the, the publisher that uh, that released my book, A Book Apart, you know, all their books are very like thematic and focused. So I really had to be very like streamlined about like where I ran with. So there's like a little note at the end about like worker load cooperatives are incredibly powerful and I think more folks should do them, but <laughs> I didn't really have a, a, enough space to really dive into the idea, but absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, I think these things at this point is there is just, again, I'm going to draw the parallel with web accessibility. It, there, there is so many companies already where there's no way they're going to switch to a collective or something. So all we have is the power of a union to, to try and steer things. It's almost like uh, people, as sad as it is, people aren't just going to make their sites accessible unless there's legislation that forces them to do so or, or you pay a massive right. fee for that. So sometimes you need to use the big hammer just to kind of, you know, fix, fix the problem try to fix the problem or make yeah. it a little better skulk I, I love that parallel i mean as any designer worth their salt will tell you it's much harder and much more expensive to make an inaccessible website accessible than it is to do it right from the outset and i think that that parallel can apply to union organizing as well because um and i talk a little bit about this in the book but the response that some workers do get um to forming a union is incredibly hard, um, that they're treated very poorly by their management, or they find that it's just simply a lot of work to talk to their coworkers, to uh, get people on board. And um, most union organizers that I spoke with um, suffered from burnout, they suffered from stress, um, but many of them also said that they would do it again in a heartbeat because it's incredibly rewarding work as well. So. Um, I think the parallels with web accessibility are are very strong. It's a really great point. So um, you've been in the industry for a long time, as you mentioned, and you've done a whole bunch of different things. So this conversation is going to jump all over the place. So listeners, just let's do it. Bear with us. Bear with us. It'll all make sense. <laughs> so <laughs> AI is everywhere. Love it, hate it, indifferent to it. It's here. You're not putting the genie back in the bottle. There's too much money in this now. Too many people are already reliant on this um, for their YouTube channels because they talk about it and they've gotten a lot of subscribers. And now, uh, or because it helps them, really helps them in their day to day. I mean, I won't lie. I use it. it I, there's a lot of things it does really well, but there's a lot of concerns about this thing. And I think one of the biggest concerns is training data, where the training data comes from, how it was trained upon. And there's been a couple of folks at a couple of companies that's been in really awkward situations where questions were asked and they were like, I don't know. <laughs> they did the, the classic FBI thing, you know, of like, I cannot confirm nor deny. Um, but <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you wrote an, an interesting piece called Blocking the Bots. Um, mm. Tell us more. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a quick little blog entry I wrote. Um, man, I got opinions about AI. Um, not least that every time I say AI, I, I'm really working hard not to do air, air quotes. But um, it does seem to be pretty popular right now with the kids and whatnot. Um, but I think a lot of my issues around it, these AI platforms. Um, really does come down to kind of the labor question and that impacts so much of it um training data is a big part of it the fact that a lot of these llm platforms have been trained on effectively pirated or stolen work um, without any kind of like license or uh, consent from people who have written that content and so this blog entry that i wrote was the fact that i didn't want my site's content to be used or ingested by any of these platforms. Um, and I get a little frustrated because there's no way to opt out. There's no easy way to opt out. Um, and, you know, there's probably a whole other discussion around there. Like, none of these platforms operate on an opt-in basis. That you actually, their, their assumption by default is that, oh, everything in the commons is available for us to sort of like slurp up and train our models on. But uh, at least for me, what I decided to do was kind of um, uh, basically build on some work that some other people had already done and um, who would have written about the fact that you just have to sort of like keep a register of known user agents that are associated with these different platforms and keep adding them to your robots.txt file. Um, so all, all my blog entry was was kind of like a, a slight tweak on that, which is rather than using robots.txt, um, 
I basically just decided to include some some bot banning uh, some bot banning rewrite rules in my my servers like um, HTT or my servers HT access file basically to sort of like block them outright. My thinking at least was, you know, robots.txt is sort of contingent upon these bots actually honoring robots.txt, whereas my server, you know, sort of like server-side configuration is, at least in my thinking, um, a little bit stronger of a, of a gate around my content. Um, somebody on Mastodon did end up pointing out that um, one of the Google bots that I I'd listed doesn't actually um, honor mod rewrite or it doesn't honor ht access rules and so it like only sort of like reads robots.txt i'm not exactly sure what the logic was so anyway i ended up like duplicating the content in both sides both of my uh ht access and at robots.txt but but at the end of the day like that's that's the sort of process that i ended up uh walking folks through because man i really don't want to have to think about this stuff i wish it wasn't this hard to just sort of like always be vigilant and stay on top of all these user agents. But um, yeah, people should have a say over whether or not their content is actually used. Yeah. It sounds like I'm going to be the parallel guy today because it. Um, I feel like I can draw some parallels there again. <laughs> so yeah. I think on the one on the one hand, I can kind of um, draw a parallel between that and what's happening in open source to a large extent, where for years and years, the understanding was that you contribute to an open source project and it's something that benefits let's let's be really uh, broad here and say humanity um, and it is always free and available to everybody to use as they see and deem fit now so you could say okay but that means that i can do with it whatever i want right so i can i can close it down and make money from it because well, closing down, I'm not so sure that I agree with that part, but okay, fair enough if we go there. But I think, like with many things in life, I think there was a certain, um, I don't know, there was a certain agreement there between the people that, that said, I will not do this. I can, but I won't. You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. But alas, what has been happening more and more now is that people have said, thank you for all your contributions. We're closing the door and we're going to make a bunch of money. And you're like, whoa. And, and you know, you have no, no recourse really there because it was open source. You contributed your time and, and effort and knowledge to this thing. And we've decided that we're going to apply a different license to it. That's not as permissive. Uh, we no longer accept contributions because we don't want to get in trouble going forward. But we will take your old contributions and make money from it, um, which very much feels like this idea of real. In, it was in the commons. So, you know, you can't complain about it. Then you should have put it behind a paywall. So we've ingested it now and we're going to make money from it. And sorry, but there's no way for you to opt out of this easily. Um, and then the other parallel <laughs> I want to draw is between what you've said, the fact that it's a opt out and not an opt in and also the fact that you ethan now have to go and figure out robots.txt and hd access and oh now i have to somehow sync between the two it's kind of like the oil and gas industry right who said no 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 no. the reason the world is a mess is not us it's because you should recycle more yeah, right. you should use less you should do this, that, and the other thing. The onus is on you. You're going to have to fix this problem. Yeah. It feels to me very much yeah. like that kind of thing. And I love both of those parallels, Skulk. That's, that's, both of those are excellent. I mean, because I think that's right. I think that these, these AI companies are extractive. They have extractive business models. And I don't mean that in a political sense. It's, I think it's a statement of fact that um, without this operating assumption that the entire internet's content is freely accessible to them, regardless of its license, regardless of um, the financial status of the people who produced it. Um, they should be able to hoover it up, feed it into their models, and use it to produce a tremendous amount of potential profit um, without paying any of that profit back to the people who actually contributed to their, their initial training data at the outset. Um, I think that's exactly right. And they're operating in a regulatory gray space, at least in the U.S. A lot of these companies are kind of hoping that there's never going to be kind of like a, a, a ruling around 
data produced from derivative content. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's a really great parallel. It's unfortunate. I mean, I. I... I always, I like, I know it's the way the world works, but it doesn't mean I have to like it, right? Mm. Um, it's a lot of yeah. these things, like I mentioned the legislation yeah. aspect. It's like, you would think people would look at it and say, you yeah, know, the web should be accessible by everybody. That's just the way it's, it should be. It, it, it shouldn't need to take legislation and threats of court, uh, you know, being sued and stuff like that for you to do the right thing. But alas, here we are. I know. Um, it kind of leads yep. into <laughs> into the next topic that I was thinking about. Like yesterday was, so today is April 25. So yesterday, 24th of April was JS Naked Day. Strangely enough, I've never heard yeah, of it before. I just found out about this. Yeah. I know. I think, I think this is the, is this the first one? I love it. I, love I don't it. know, but I dig it. And I, so what I did was um, I fired up, uh, screen studio i went to a couple of websites and i recorded what happens when i turn off javascript um mm. the first one i did and honestly like i said i wasn't picking on react afterwards i was like oh man why did i choose react as the first one this is so <laughs> but i just went to the documentation site and i just turned off javascript and they did, actually didn't do didn't do badly at all i encountered all one right. thing which i was all like right. That could be a summary details, and then we didn't even need JavaScript. Mm. But in general, it was good. I could navigate the documentation, and everything was fine. Um, then I, good. yeah, that's cool. So I, then I went to, um, oh man, I can't remember what the segment was. But then I did the chatbots. Oh, I did CNN, oh, the classic CNN.com. They didn't do okay. Good. How'd that do? Not great. Their oh, search no. doesn't oh, work no. at all if you have JavaScript disabled. You can't search. You can you can type it in. You can press enter, but there are no search results. Also, their main like primary menu um, doesn't open. But what I also discovered was even when JavaScript's enabled, if you click on the little hamburger, their menu will open. Pressing escape doesn't close it though. Um, no, sure. Which is sure. a basic like accessibility yeah. thing. So I just picked that up by accident. But then I went to the chatbots and oh boy, <laughs> if you turn off JavaScript, <laughs> there's nothing. The funniest one was- Just I a bunch of blank screens. Just a blank screen. The funniest one I think was Google Gemini because the only thing that remained on the page was my little avatar on the top right. It, it sits there pretty and the rest of the page is just white. <laughs> I'm like, I understand. I wasn't expecting much, but I was expecting at least yeah. some kind of message to tell you maybe what this tool is and why it requires JavaScript and how you can turn it on, something like that, you know. But now all I tested Claude, ChatGPT, Gemini, and Microsoft Copilot across the board, same deal. Um, Claude had uh -huh. a little spinner that just kept spinning, and the others were just poop blank screens. So, but yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that was disappointing but um yeah not surprising unfortunately and so what i want to kind of talk about is is this idea like i think you know seeing that you you coined the responsive design thing i think part of that was you know this whole idea of different environments um that, and you don't really have control over how people are going to access your content so you need to kind of be responsive to to the different environments and i think some of the things that from the olden days if i can put it that way that's been lost is this idea of progressive enhancement um sarah Souden mm. mentioned that just before the um yesterday she mentioned the fact that what has happened to progressive enhancement? Do people just not do it anymore? Because there's no reason why a hamburger menu shouldn't work. Like it should just be the expanded menu. It might not look great, but at least people can access and navigate your site, right? But instead it's yeah. it's just inaccessible because now you have JavaScript disabled. So I've I've yacked a lot now, but basically what I'm trying to trying to get at is just your general thoughts on Web development has come a long way and the underlying technologies, just talking from straight up the web platform, so just HTML, CSS, JavaScript has evolved immensely since the days of when Absolutely. responsive design just started. But in some ways, it feels that what we make today is worse for the end user yeah. than what it used to be. Like, yeah. how did, any, any ideas, how did this happen? How did, how did we get here? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I think there were many answers to it. Capitalism probably is part of the problem. 
<laughs> but but I I do think that I do think that there's a real crisis in how we think about the web and how organizations think about the web. I write a little bit about this on my blog, well, probably more than a little bit, but I do think that some of it comes down to individual priorities, you know, individual designers, engineers, um, and when they're facing a deadline, um, I think it's hard for folks to find time to step out of a lot of the implicit biases that we bring to our work that um, just because something looks good at a certain breakpoint doesn't necessarily mean that the responsive experience is, is great across the board. Or if it works well for me who, with a, a body that behaves and acts a certain way, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work well for everybody who visits my website. If somebody doesn't have access to a mouse or they're tabbing manually through my design or they're having the contents of my page read aloud to them with a screen reader, um, that experience isn't necessarily going to be representative of how they're encountering my work. So I think that those individual priorities kind of bubble up to organizational priorities where businesses don't prioritize performance or accessibility until there's some sort of external pressure, um, whether or not um, that's legislation, whether it's regulatory, whether it's consumer-led sort of like pressure. Um, and I think that there's a real issue there that we think about we have as an industry by and large treated performances and accessibility as something that's separate from web design. It's not part of the craft, right? It's something extra. Um, you know, even the chatbot example you mentioned before, I could absolutely understand the situation or I can envision a situation in which a product manager is maybe like, okay, well, accessibility is not part of the MVP. Right. We need to get this out the door. We need to get this in front of our users, in front of investors, right? And we'll think about the accessibility needs at a later milestone. I think that's a very common approach. But you know, the actual like interaction model of a chatbot, you know, there's nothing to say that all has to happen on a client, right? That by default it could just be a form that's posting somewhere and getting a response back. Like that's a very simple interaction model. But um I think we tend to index on the very sort of like flashy UI model without thinking about like, is this well built? Is this resilient? Is it fast? Is it going to be accessible to somebody who doesn't have a device like mine? And I think that historically, and this is just my opinion here, but I think a lot of the advocacy work around performance and around accessibility has been targeted at individual designers and engineers which I think it should be, I mean, because there's a lot of education that needs to happen. I mean, I'm still learning about performance and accessibility, and I've been in the industry for entirely too long. I think my opinion is that, unfortunately, without that sort of like organizational reckoning, without leadership of an organization actually saying that this is a priority for us as a product organization, individual designers and engineers caring doesn't scale, right? That this is something that needs to be budgeted for, it needs to be resourced appropriately, needs to be treated as part of the core offering that these companies are bringing to the market. And until that happens, I don't know how we have a conversation as an industry, how we actually address that as a, as a problem. But it needs to be addressed because there's a lot of work to do. I see those web aim um, million homepages reports every year, and uh, there's just so much work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Can design systems play a role here? Should, or should I say can or should design systems? And the people, I think all of this comes down to a people thing, right? Um, I think you alluded to it right just now. Um, so maybe include that aspect of it as well. So, you know, should a design system play a role here or the people that build said design system? should they be in a position where they can drive this from inside? But again, you know, if priorities are misaligned, then you're in a tough situation. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, Skulk. And I think that, I mean, yes, but it, 
A design system is not its components. A design system is the people that use those components and um, the rules and the processes around them. Like that's that for me is what a design system is. And because you can you can build a host of accessible components, but until you've actually seen how they're arranged, it's very easy to make an inaccessible page from accessible materials. So I do think that design systems teams are potentially in a great point of leverage to fix a lot of issues at an organization. Um, but again, they need to be resourced properly. They need to be empowered to partner with different teams at that organization to say, okay, well, let's approach this in a different way that rather than, you know, just sort of like hoping that things are going to improve, that they actually need to, I guess, be a check on inaccessible work getting to their end users, um, if that makes sense. Like, um, yeah, I do think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there, but uh, they need to be empowered to, uh, to leverage it. Yeah, that that's the, that's the underlying problem, it seems, the lack of empowerment of the people that actually... Sometimes the people who actually care. I mean, I've seen it personally. I've I've seen people care, and then other priorities just kind of steamrolling over that. And it's you know, some people yeah. eventually give up. Yeah. I I think Todd Libby. Yeah. I think, um, like he basically said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm leaving this industry mm. because sure. I can't anymore. Like I've done so many accessibility audits. I need to do it the next year and tell you exactly the same thing I told you last year. Um, yeah. and at some point it just becomes yeah. like this, you know, I don't know, you're just going in circles. I, i I felt that when I was teaching, uh, guitar years back where clearly the the child doesn't want to learn the instrument, but their parents feel that, that it's good for them to build character or whatever they think. And you teach them something this week and like, okay, cool, go home, practice. The next week they come back. You're like, okay, show me what you practice. And you can see, you know, they didn't practice. So you have to like teach them exactly the same thing you did. It, it's it it's not great. It's not a great feeling. It yeah. feels like, yeah. what am I even doing here? No, no. I was just gonna like that. That 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 sounds incredibly frustrating. And I mean, I have a lot of friends who work in accessibility, and um, they struggle with a lot of the same feelings. And some of them struggle with burnout. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, um, I think if an organization really cares about accessibility, that caring for those people who are actually trying to fix the product should be a priority for them. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a that's a real shame. Before we move on to anything else, what is your hope for the web? Because it feels like we're at, we're in this conversation right now. We're at this really low point. So I want to like bring <laughs> bring up the energy a little bit. Yeah. If if you could like, <laughs> what is your what is your hope? What is your dream? What would you like to see? Like, should we have this conversation again in 10 years time or something? Like, what would you like to say different than today? Yeah, yeah, well, um, man, that's a great question, Skulk. Thanks for asking me, because I think like, you're right. Like things, things do feel hard right now. And a lot of this is the fact that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs in the last like year and a half. So that's, that's kind of like the moment we're, we're working in, but, um, I'll tell you that I do get a tremendous amount of hope writing about labor in tech, in part because I see people showing up every day, whether it's forming a union or organizing some sort of action at work, like these are people who are stepping forward, sticking their neck out in some regards, and trying to make their work better. And I got to tell you that as dark as things feel sometimes, like, Hearing those stories is um, it's, it's it's remarkable, frankly. I've spoken to some extraordinary people working on this book, and it gives me it gives me a tremendous amount of hope for the industry. Um, I will also say that, like, just as a web designer, you know, there's a lot of challenging work being done in the industry. Um, the industry going all in and all on AI, uh, you know. It's a little bit challenging for me, I'll just say that. But um, I've also met some remarkable people doing incredible work. And, um, you know, folks like 
designers that are getting excited about new features in CSS and talking about like how they've decided to start using them on their websites. Um, finding illustrators on Mastodon, thinking about like, um, I read this really wonderful blog entry recently about somebody who'd recently redone their homepage with a really beautiful comic. And then they wrote this whole blog entry about how they really thought about the responsive breakpoints and how that could maybe reflow the work in interesting ways to sort of like communicate some of the same tension they had on wider screen breakpoints. And it's just like, I do think that there's a renaissance happening right now around small indie websites, small personal websites. And I don't know, that's, those are, those are incredibly remarkable stories in their own right. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to happen. Um, but there is a lot of really good people doing that work right now. Um, so that, that also gives me a tremendous amount of hope. I hear you on that one. And I'm here for it, 100%. This, this whole indie movement, that, that's like, you can feel it bubbling up. Man, I'm excited for, for what's going to come from this. I hope we can take the web back. It's like, you know, Portland's got the saying of like, keep Portland weird. Like, we, I spoke with a friend of mine the other day and we said like, we have to make the web weird again and then keep it that way. It's become just a, a money machine, right? It's lost the beauty and the... I mean, CSA Zen Garden was one of the coolest things ever. You just has this bunch of HTML and you put CSS on top and suddenly you have all these different ways of looking at essentially the same underlying structure. And we've lost a lot of that. We've lost a lot of that. I don't know. I think that the, the indie web movement, I think, has been there for a long time. And I also think that there is a real resurgence in, in it right now. Um, I just saw... Man, what did I just just see? Oh, Erica Hall, who wrote a really fantastic book called Just Enough Research. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that Erica is also a, a painter and has been doing just a, an ongoing study of chickens. <laughs> what? Uh, so, so, so basically just painting chickens. And, and Erica just launched chicken.pics, <laughs> which is literally just all of her really beautiful watercolors and paintings of amazing chickens and mm -hmm. it's great and it doesn't need to do more than that it's just a website with chicken pics and it's 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 fantastic so let's let's keep the web weird i think we need more weird web and um i don't know skulk i hope you make what, what uh t-shirts with that because that's that's a fantastic motto yeah yeah let's do it let's do it like i spoke to somebody the other day uh crystal mars and we coined the phrase um share the awesome and like now he's made stickers and he's printing stickers so i mean you know let's make t-shirts <laughs> that's great let's do it man let's that's do what it. i love i love let's that i love the collaborative aspect around the web and the people on the web and then you know all these cool ideas coming out of it and taking their own little life um on like responsive web design is an example of that right uh, ajax is an example of that the technologies existed somebody was just like hey, I'm going to give it this catchy name and we're going to talk about it from a broader t perspective and all of a sudden it like changes how people look at what's possible on the web. You know, you coined responsive web design and people are like, what? Oh, and it, everything changed. Everything changed. So um, you wrote this post called Generative and uh, it's very interesting. I, I want to, so you start off so by you made everybody a playlist and I read through it. And now I don't know if this is just me or if this was the intent, but what I got from it is, so all of this is essentially about AI from different perspectives, different articles and stuff. But it feels to me like it starts in this utopian world where AI is an incredible, beautiful thing that does all these amazing things. And as you move down, it becomes more darker and darker and things start to fall apart. Is that what your intent was with that or? That was my intent. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Um, you nailed it. You nailed it, Skulk. Yeah. It's uh, it's not a subtle playlist, but it's, it's a, it's a bunch of quotes basically from, um, it starts with some, you know, leaders in the AI space to some folks who are, sort of like design adjacent, but who are sort of like talking up the benefits of, of using AI based tools. And then it kind of like moves on from there to talking about like a lot of the labor impact or about the fact that some of these tools actually generate 
a tremendous amount of um, spam or um, misinformation um, that they actually have some real real harms bracketed in them. And I did that because um, I think there are people who talk up the benefits of these AI tools, um, and they're they're fairly responsible about like talking about the um, the potential drawbacks or the limitations. I think Simon Willison does a really remarkable job of this. I mean, he's he's been incredibly vocal about how LLMs have been incredible use incredibly useful for his work, but he also talks about like they're not good for everything. They have some very specific use cases. They also have some real drawbacks, and you need to actually be mindful about how you use these tools. Um, I think that's a really great example of them, doing them right. But when I when I hear posts talking about how these are going to supercharge your productivity or um, you know that they're going to transform your business, um, a little skeptical bulb goes off somewhere in my I don't know skeptical bulb. I don't know what that means, but like um, I do think that we need to be very clear about the fact that these tools are they have some severe limitations and they also have some severe you know, we've talked a little bit about this, but they have some, some real harms baked into them. So, um, so that's kind of where the post started. Um, but there's also somebody who, a quote in the post, who's been a big influence on me, which is a, a woman named Ursula Franklin, um, who wrote this fantastic book that I really wish I'd read at the very beginning of my career called The Real World of Technology. And, um, you know, I can't give your listeners homework, but if I could... I would totally recommend checking out that book or um, even listening to the lectures that she gave. There's audio recordings of them online um, that turned into the book because they are fantastic. And, and she talks about this cycle where every technology throughout human history sort of starts from this like um, this incredible amount of enthusiasm and advocacy and sort of like talking about like how this new technology is going to be world changing and going to free up our time and improve productivity. And all that enthusiasm and boosterism sort of basically just makes this technology accessible for the society at large and eventually becomes a tool for, well, effectively exploitation. That becomes a, um, an expectation. It's an institutionalized thing that we have to work with. And the thing that she notes is that when you get to that point, it's worth looking back and realizing that all the promises that were initially made never actually materialized. That this becomes a tool for business, for big government, and uh, for the military potentially. So, um, so that's 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 something I'm really mindful of right now as we're in the the AI hype cycle. Um, regardless of where it goes, regardless of where these tools go, we need to take a hard look at you know the potential harms of these tools and what they do and don't do right now, um, while we're talking up their their potential benefits. Yeah, well said, well said. Yeah, I love that piece. Um, it, it's super great. I, yeah, very, very well thought thought through. I like the, like the title, just like generative, because it's what these tools do, right? But then it's also like if you can imagine it generating a future and this future starting off beautiful, you know, think about Firefly and, and these things generating these beautiful images just from text. But then over time it starts feeding on itself and then it starts divulging mm. all the ugly things and it starts surfacing all the ugly things. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was great that I, I loved it. So, uh, I was going to make this next thing like very podcast specific because we're on a podcast, but I want to throw it open and make it like broad. Like if, if you want to, if you want to limit it to podcast, that's super, but don't feel like you need to. It's just like, maybe I'm going to ask it instead of your five favorite industry related or adjacent podcasts, let's just make it resources. And if those happen to be podcasts, okay. that's great. Oh man. Yeah. I, I wish I listened to more podcasts because I don't. Um, and that's, 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 that's like a limitation of how my brain works. Like if I'm sitting and working, um, it's really hard for me to like, have somebody talking, I guess, while I'm working. So if I had a commute, I would totally be all about podcasts. But um, um, I will say that when I do listen to podcasts, um, industry podcasts, I do think the Shop Talk Show is one of my favorites. Um, I mean, I know Chris and Dave uh, pretty well, and they're they're just fantastic hosts. I've been lucky enough to be on the show a couple times, but um, they're just such great conversationalists and really good thinkers, and I, I really enjoy listening to them. 
Um, let's see, other favorite resources. Um, well, I'll just another plug for Ursula Franklin's like real world of technology. It's a it's a short book. I think it's a fantastic read. Um, and she was just a tremendous thinker and remarkably just accomplished. So uh, so anything that she writes, I would totally recommend. I would, but you know, definitely go there. Um, I'm gonna cheat and recommend two sites by one of my favorite people. Um, Mandy Brown runs two of my favorite websites. Um, she has a workinglibrary.com and it's her blog, but it's also sort of like her bookshelf. Like she logs most of the books that she reads there and with some thoughts and I find so many wonderful thinkers and writers through her, so I think it's remarkable. Um, and Mandy has recently transitioned her career into being a professional coach, um, and I can't think of anybody better for that kind of work, but she also has a really uh, lovely professional blog called everythingchanges.us, so everything changes us, um, and I love that domain name. But um, she writes these really wonderful essays about our relationship to work and how we can effectively build a better version of work while actually moving through those spaces. And, um, you know, I, I would totally recommend checking it out if you're not already subscribed. I think it's wonderful. Oh, and I guess the last thing that kind of comes to mind is uh, Robin Rendell has uh, been doing some really wonderful work about sort of the future of CSS. He's got the, the, uh, the cascade, I think he calls it. Um, I would totally recommend checking that out. And, and Robin's own blog too is, is really fantastic. So, I would uh, I would check that out. Nice, love all of them. I I was just introduced to the Cascade by Sarah Sarah Salden. She shared it on uh, oh fantastic on the Bird site, and I was like, ah, oh, this is such a cool site. Um, it's in my newsletter that's coming out Sunday. Um, so thanks so much, Ethan, for taking time to to speak with me and share all your insights and knowledge. Um, I really really appreciate it. It was a it's a wonderful conversation. Can't wait to share it with everyone um in closing where can people find you and support you and the work you do yeah thanks Skulk. i appreciate that um uh, best way to find me is probably my website which is uh ethanmarcott.com and there's some links in the bottom for various social situations i guess um, i'm most active on mastodon these days i miss twitter dearly but uh i can't go back there anymore but uh, yeah, on the socials, it's mainly Mastodon, a little bit on Instagram and a little bit on Blue Sky. But so far, the uh, the Mastodon situation has been really wonderful. So, um, but yeah, you can find my uh, my blog at ethanmarcott.com. You can also sign up for uh, getting new entries mailed to you if, uh, if that's more your thing. So, this has been a fantastic conversation, Skulk. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, pleasure is all mine. Thanks so much, Ethan. Thank you for listening to the Mechanical Inc. podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with your friends. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Have something to add? Continue the conversation on GitHub and join the community on Slack. Until the next one, keep all the things open.